So this is going to be my first on-camera video for the channel. And what I wanted to do was go through some of the upgrades and modifications that I've made to my 2017 Africa Twin to make it a pretty capable adventure bike. There's a lot to cover, so this might end up being a pretty long video. What I've done in the description section is break up the video into sections. So you can just jump down there, take a look at what you're interested in, and jump ahead. The way I'm thinking of going through this is to break it up into four sections. So the first will be protection which really, if you're only gonna do one thing to this bike, you gotta put some protection on it if you're gonna start taking it off-road. Then we'll cover suspension and wheels, and I think from a performance and handling perspective, really suspension is where you should spend your money. It's the biggest, weakest link uh, in terms of the performance of this bike. Then I wanna cover some simple drivetrain modifications that I've made that has made this bike easier to handle off-road at slow speeds. And um, then finally, just kind of a long list of miscellaneous items that are by no means a must-have, um, but certainly make the bike more enjoyable um, on long trips. So let's start with protection. Um, from the factory, the bike comes with hardly any protection to speak of at all, and it's really the first thing you're going to want to do if you want to take the bike off-road. If you ride in remote locations and by yourself, one good fall could leave you stranded, and so it's critical to address the protection element. And start up here with the hand guards. The bike does come with some brush guards that uh, look very much the part. They look very similar to these, but they're not. They're made out of plastic. They're missing the important part of the guard, which is the metal brace that does all the protecting. And so they might protect your hands from wind, but that's about it. Um, this part of the bike, nine out of 10 times, is gonna be the first part to contact the ground. So it's important to protect. And uh, I think those plastic guards that come with the bike with the first drop, those are gonna shatter and they'll leave your levers exposed to damage. And if you break those, you could end up being stuck. So this is a really pretty simple modification. Um, there's tons of options in the aftermarket to choose from. I think they're all probably roughly equal. I went with the tried and true Bark Busters in the color matched white, and they've served me well. I mean, if you take a look here, you can see that they've been thoroughly tested. Um, if you watch any of my riding videos, you can see that I dropped the spike a lot in all kinds of conditions. And other than, you know, some, uh, some rash on the plastic part of the guard, they've held up great, they've done their job, they've protected the levers, and so definitely a worthwhile investment there. While we're up here, um, I wanna talk about the mirrors. So this isn't really protection, but it will increase the crashworthiness of the bike. These are the double take mirrors, and they're a great item. Um, first of all, they're just very nice mirrors. They have a very nice shape, they give you great visibility, they don't vibrate, um, they're infinitely adjustable by virtue of having these two ball mounts that allow the, both the mirror and the arm to move in every possible direction. Um, but when you, once you tighten it up, they st stay in place. But So they're a nice mirror, but that's not really what they're about. What they're about is when you take a hit, they're able to just move out of the way like this. Um, they don't bend, they don't break, they just move out of the way. And there's tons of videos all over the internet of people like smashing these things with baseball bats. Um, I haven't personally tried it, but they seem to hold up pretty well even to that kind of abuse. And when you get back out on the road, just readjust, retighten, and they'll stay put. So you don't have to get these. They're not a must-have item, but if you stick with your stock mirrors and you drop the bike a lot, they'll probably bend or break eventually. And then you can get these. Again, staying up here in the cockpit area, um, I want to talk about this piece here, which again is not protection as much as it is reinforcement. One of the compromises that Honda made on this bike, uh, seeking to make it as light as possible, is that there are places where they use probably a thinner gauge material than they should have, maybe less reinforcement than they should have. And the head frame that holds up the dash is one of those areas. And the welds there are kind of weak. And so people would go and hang their GPS on this little bar that's made for hanging your GPS and then they'd go ride some washboard and actually the rattle would end up breaking, stressing and breaking the welds. And that's a catastrophic failure, a very expensive failure to fix. And Camel ADV then produced this brace, which ties into several points and provides kind of a 3D rigidity to the whole area um, and, and really reinforces it. So you don't have to worry about having your welds snap. And the other nice thing for some, uh, for me, all I do is hang my phone on this, but um, people that like to hang a lot of different accessories, this does give you a lot of real estate for that. And if you do like to hang a lot of accessories, it's particularly important to reinforce this area because it's going to put more stress on those wells. So a nice piece of insurance. I would recommend it. It's fairly inexpensive, fairly easy to install. The last piece here in the cockpit is this uh, bracing riser by Toratec. 
Now, I don't need a riser. I'm 5'10", and uh, unless you're above six feet, this bike really doesn't require risers. The rise here is minimal. It's only 20 millimeters compared to the 50 to 70 you would get with like something like a Rox risers. That's not really the point. The point is the bridging part of it. So what this does is it links and bridges the mounts for the handlebars. And the reason that's important, in my experience, when I would be dropping the bike and it was the handlebars would hit the ground, they would get twisted. Um, the, the two independent mounts would get twisted relative to each other and your bars would be out of alignment. And it's really hard to get to the nuts down here that you need to loosen, adjust, and then retighten to fix that. Really, you need a really long extender for your socket. And it's not something that's practical to carry on a long trip. Um, so this was really a big pain. And this bridge and riser ties these two mounts together so that they can't pivot relative to each other, keeps the bars fixed in place. And it's really solved the problem. I will say this is probably the most overpriced piece of equipment on the entire bike. This little piece of aluminum cost a hundred bucks. It is tour tech, so to be expected. Um, but despite the fact that it's so overpriced, it really does do a nice job and keeps the bars uh, from um, moving out of the way. So now moving on to sort of the, the larger pieces of protection. What I have is the Alt-Rider setup. The bike, I bought it used and it came with the Alt-Rider lowers. And I went out and I did a bunch of research on the internet and was ultimately convinced that Alt-Rider was the way to go um, based on sort of beefiness of construction, the, the way it's mounted to the bike. And I went ahead and I got the uppers and the bash plate. So I'll start with the lowers. They are very beefy, very thick. I think the thickest available for this bike. Um, they have a very nice offset and they do a great job of protecting the engine and the cases. And you can see this bike's been down a ton other than missing some paint here, which is to be expected. There are no dings, no dents, no bends. Um, the um, mounting points have not been damaged or torqued in any way. And um, you know, they're doing their job. So I don't know what else to say about that. I do like the way they're mounted. Um, they're mounted to two strong points in the frame, nowhere near any kind of engine mount or anything like that. So minimal risk of damaging the bike when they're doing their job trying to protect it. For the uppers, you know, I really wasn't sure initially if I wanted to get the uppers. There are some bikes that don't need them. The Tenere 700, for example, is a narrow bike. When it falls, it doesn't really need protection here because the tank will never hit the ground. Uh, but the Africa Twin is a voluptuous gal. You can see the tank really sticks out. And as you can see by all the rash on these uppers, this part of the bike makes contact with the ground. And I'm pretty confident to say that if these weren't here, at minimum the plastics possibly the tank and possibly the radiator would have taken some impact on some of those falls. And, um, you know, I'd rather that they didn't. And so these uppers uh, provide that protection. They're not quite as beefy as the lowers, but they do fine. Um, there's absolutely no play after all these falls and um, they've done their job and protected the bike. Uh, and then finally, the skid plate here. It's a, it's a beefy aluminum skid plate. Uh, it's well mounted again. It does not mount to any part that contacts the engine. Um, relatively easy to take off to change your oil. Relatively light for its beefiness. Um, and I will say, you know, here's the Africa Twin. You know, it does come stock with a skid plate. Here it is. It's not terrible. You know, it's a thick piece of metal. Um, so it's not like a tin foil or anything like that, like some people say. Certainly not as beefy as that one, but the big difference is coverage. So if I line up this skid plate next to the Alt-Rider skid plate, you can see right away that the, um, the header portion is completely not covered by the stock skid plate. Uh, and it is by the Alt-Rider one. And so, you know, I would rather not take a rock to the headers because that could be big damage. Um, and so this skid plate prevents that, this one would not. The other thing I wanted to say about the skid plate is that they do have an option that allows you to get a longer one that will protect the wishbone on the shock. For me, I don't hop a lot of logs or, or do that kind of riding. I'm not such an aggressive rider that I didn't feel I needed that protection. So I took a pass, but if you do that kind of riding, you may consider that extender to protect the wishbone on the shock. The last piece of Alt-Rider equipment on this bike is the radiator guard. It's not that much to say about a radiator guard. I will say it was relatively easy to mount and it has this nice design of these three-dimensionally louvered um, fins on the radiator guard, which I think make it stronger so it can better take a hit from an incoming rock and also allow for better airflow. So it's a nice piece. It does its job. Um, no issues with radiator impact. It's fairly light and um, good piece of insurance. Again, probably worth getting. 
The last piece of protection on the bike is this camel brace, again from Camel ADV. And this is another one of those areas where Honda made some material compromises. And that's with respect to this piece right here, which is a pretty important piece on the bike because it serves as the mount for the peg, it serves as the pivot point for the rear brake, and as a mount for the exhaust. And so if this breaks, you'll be kind of stuck. And it's made out of cast aluminum, which is odd because on the other side, it's the, the other uh, mount is made out of cast iron. And because it's made out of cast aluminum, there's been a lot of reports of people that will take a hit from the front or from below, and this piece will snap. And you really don't want that again because it's such a critical piece. So what Camel ADV has done is they've made this really beefy, I don't know if this is uh, steel or iron, but this really beefy brace. It acts almost as a mini skid plate to protect this part from impact from below or from the front. But in addition to that, the way it's tied in, it actually adds rigidity uh, to that mount to that peg mount. And so even if you do take a hit, it's less likely to break. Um, so it's a really nice piece, comes with great instructions, fairly easy to mount up, and, um, and again, protects an important part of the bike. So I think that's it for protection. I will say this is a pretty extensive protection setup. There's, you know, I don't have things like, you know, the brake reservoir protector or things like that that are kind of silly in my opinion. But in terms of major pieces of protection, this bike is fully armored because again, for me, that's a priority. And I'm willing to add the nearly 20 pounds of extra weight that this all adds to the bike to make sure that it's protected. For you, maybe, you know, you, your calculus works out the other way and you prefer not to have the weight. Um, but for me, uh, the protection is key. Okay, so next let's talk about suspension. I think from a performance perspective, the suspension on this bike is definitely the weakest link. Like most of these big adventure bikes, the Africa Twin comes under sprung. I weigh 180 pounds, 200 pounds in full gear. And before I put any luggage on the bike whatsoever, I already would max out the preload and still couldn't get the sag set properly. And on the front in particular, this would manifest as a couple of things. The first is it would dive. Just pulling up to a red light, as soon as I touched that front brake, it would just dive. Uh, and the forks would collapse. And when I'd go out riding twisties, the handling and you know the, the turning precision was really poor. And that's again, because of this really mushy, really soft suspension. So the obvious thing to do here would be to simply respring front and back and possibly do a little bit of revalving to accommodate these new stiffer springs. And that was my plan. And then I did a little bit more research and I found out that on these early models, I think they solved this by 2019, but on the early models, there were problems with the coating on the stanchions of the forks, such that after about 10,000 miles, not in every case, but fairly frequently, uh, that coating would start to wear. And then the fork would start to stick. It was a phenomenon called stiction where initially under load, the fork would not collapse. And then as you added more and more load, eventually it would break free and collapse. And it made for a very uneven and rough sort of performance for the forks. And, you know, after doing enough research on this, I decided I didn't want to spend a bunch of money respringing and revalving these forks just 10,000 miles later to have to replace or recoat them, which was a very expensive thing to do. So I did go ahead and buy the Olin's forks for this bike, which um, have been a huge improvement. Um, I mean, night and day, no more dive, excellent razor sharp precision in terms of turning and corners have made this bike really a joy to ride. This is a race suspension and it's way too much suspension for me. I can't probably make use of more than 10% of its capabilities, but for that peace of mind of not having to worry about stiction developing, um, it was worth getting and it, it's been you know a major performance improvement for the bike. On the rear, the shock on the Africa Twin is totally fine. It doesn't have that stiction problem. And really all you'd have to do is change the springs and maybe that's it, or maybe a little bit of revalving. And that's what I intended to do. I took it to a local suspension shop. I don't know if it was because of the pandemic or what, but two months later, they still weren't able to get the job done, even though it's a relatively simple job. And I finally said, you know what? Keep the shock. I'm not paying for the work that you haven't done. And I went out and I bought the matching Olin shock. This is the adventure model and um, put it in and it's been great. I certainly am, it's stiffer. I'm able to dial in the sag the way I need it. I like that it has this uh, external preload adjustment instead of the internal one on the main shock. But really in terms of incremental improvement in performance, it hasn't done nearly as much as the forks have done. And um, 
if you have a competent suspension shop near you, I would not buy this. I would just take the stock shock, get it resprung, get it revalved, and it'll do great. So um, yeah, so that's the suspension. The other part I want to talk about in this section is the wheels. So these are not stock. These are the Rally Raid tubeless wheels. I personally think it's criminal that Honda didn't at least offer an option for tubeless wheels on this bike, at least not in the early years. Um, I view it as a safety feature. You know, I think a debate can be had about tubed versus tubeless off-road, but on-road, if you're going down the freeway at 70 miles an hour and you catch a nail in a tube tire, that tube is going to blow and you're going to have an instant catastrophic loss of pressure and you might lose control of the bike as you're trying to slow it down and get it off the road. With a tubed wheel, that's not going to happen. You'll get your puncture. It'll slowly leak the air out. You are much more likely to have time to get off the freeway uh, safely. And to make the wheels uh, tubeless, what they actually had to do was make the wheels have that lip that allows the tubeless tire to seal against. The stock wheels don't have that. Um, at least the front one, I believe, doesn't. Um, and then they seal them uh, at a, they send them off to a company in Italy called uh, Bart Tubeless. They use a vulcanized rubber process to seal up um, all the openings where the spokes are. And the sealing has been excellent. I've had these now for three years, no leaks whatsoever. Um, and they perform really well. In addition to the safety piece, obviously tubeless wheels are much easier to repair. Most of the time you could occasionally have such a big tear that really, you know, only a tube could, um, like a tubeless tire becomes un unrepairable. So I do carry a spare tube in case of something like that. But 99% of the time, you're, it's going to be so much easier to repair a tubeless tire because you just use one of those um, plug kits. The last thing is, and this is minor, but the stock wheels um, had corrosion issues. Again, a coating problem um, this time on the spokes, and the spokes uh, would start corroding prematurely. I did see that some of that on my um, original wheels, and these wheels come with better spoke, first of all, more spokes, much beefier spokes, which makes the wheel tougher and more rigid, um, but also properly coated spokes so I don't have any corrosion issues. So um, not a must have, but for me, it was an important upgrade just again, from a safety perspective. Okay, so I flipped the bike around uh, so we could talk a little bit about the drivetrain modifications. So when I first got the bike, I was really struggling because I was stalling the bike a lot. Um, anytime I was kind of in slow technical terrain, um, I would find myself stalling the bike. And then of course, for me, that was the most common way to drop the bike. I would stall, lose my momentum, try to find a footing, not be able to reach because the bike is so tall and then topple over. And it was really frustrating and I was really looking for a solution beyond just trying to continue to improve the finesse in my clutch hand. The tip I got was to modify my gearing ratio, either by increasing the uh, size of the rear uh, sprocket or decreasing the size of the front sprocket. And I decided to modify the rear and the reason for that is you do get a little bit more fine control there because you can change one, two, three teeth. Three teeth on the rear is equivalent to one tooth on the front. Um, and so what I chose to do is to get a 44 tooth sprocket on the rear versus the 42 tooth sprocket that the bike comes with. And that ends up being about a 7% increase in the gearing ratio. So about a 7% increase in torque. And uh, what that translated to now is that the bike does not stall nearly as much. Essentially, I can let the clutch out with no throttle and it'll roll along on a, on a flat surface or even slightly uphill without stalling. It's made a night and day improvement uh, for me. The other sort of consequences of this is the speedometer is now off by 7%. So you have to make that mental adjustment or um, you can use, of course, your GPS or your phone speedometer. The other aspect of that is that the natural cruising speed of the bike where it sort of I end up with if I stop thinking about how fast I'm going, went down from about 85 miles an hour to about 78 miles an hour. And I like that because I think I'm less likely to get a ticket if I stay below 80. Of course, the bike will still blow through 100 miles an hour, no problem. Um, but its happy spot is around 78 now. And I like that. So overall, it's been, it's been a great improvement. Oh, the one other thing I will mention is if you do change your sprocket size, you will probably need a, a longer chain, probably about, about two teeth longer. So you may want to wait to do that until you're changing your chain anyways. You may not. Um, and then the other piece is that the markings on your swing arm to help guide your chain adjustment are going to be off now. And that's okay. You just don't freak out about it. Um, I did it first and um, it's fine. It's just the, the geometry has changed a little bit. Um, and actually it will also slightly change your wheelbase, but again, no perceptible impact on handling. So 
I um, highly recommend making this modification. It's easy, it's relatively inexpensive, and it really makes a huge difference to your um, sort of off-road slow speed handling. Oh, really any slow speed handling. The second modification to the drivetrain, this one really is a nice to have. I don't know that I would do it again, but I, uh, I purchased the Recluse Torque Drive Clutch. This is not their auto clutch. This is uh, just a Torque Drive Adventure clutch pack. Um, the reason I bought this is twofold. So essentially, this replaces the stock clutch pack, and it, you go from, I think, 18 plates in the stock pack to something like 27 in um, the Recluse one. And so more friction surface means better longevity. It's also a higher material quality. And I was about to go on a California BDR. There are some very tricky, very sandy sections there where people have been known to burn out their clutches. And I wanted to give my best chance, uh, myself the best chance for my clutch to survive in those conditions. And so I installed the Recluse primarily because of that. Um, and you know, it has held up great. Uh, I have smelt it burning every once in a while, but it just keeps on ticking and, and does a great job. The actually the, the selling point for the clutch, the reason that you know they advertise it is that you're supposed to get kind of a, a more direct connection from the engine to the wheel, a more responsive, because again, more friction surface, uh, a more responsive clutch feel. I will say I do feel like I did get that. Like um, I, I feel more connected from my clutch hand to the rear wheel, but that might just be in my head because that's what I'm expecting based on the product description. So um, I don't know for sure. I don't know that I would buy it again. I'm very happy with it, but I don't know that it's, it's something that I would spend my money on again. So that's it for drivetrain. Uh, next, we'll go through the electricals and basically all the extra little uh, creature comforts on the bike. Um, so stay tuned. This last part of the video, what I want to do is just kind of go through a series of relatively minor modifications that aren't must-haves, but really make the bike more enjoyable or more comfortable. We'll talk about some electrical modifications that make it a little easier to work with the bike. Um, and you know, hopefully this will be interesting and helpful. So we'll start from the front and work our way back. So starting at the very, very front, in the front wheel, we have uh, a tire pressure monitoring system from uh, Fobo. Um, there's a lot of manufacturers. I'm quite happy with these. And what these are basically is a couple of pressure sensing uh, stem caps that go onto your valve stems on the front and the rear tires, and they monitor the pressure and the temperature inside your tire. Um, I find this really handy for a number of reasons. First of all, in the morning, when you want to check your pressure, you don't have to get out your gauge and check. You just look on your phone and you know where your tires are at. Um, secondly, if you air down when you're riding off road and you want a little more traction, you want to air back up, it's really easy to, um, to get them to the right pressure. And what's nice about these is they will actually adjust for temperature differences because you know your, your pressure ratings on your tires and the recommended pressures are based on a cold tire. As you ride, the tire gets warmer. And uh, what's nice about these is they adjust for that and so it's really easy to figure out how much air to add back in when you're getting back on the road. Um, I'm kind of a stickler for riding at uh, specified tire pressures, so for me, this kind of scratches my OCD itch. Um, they're quite durable and rugged. They've been through uh, water crossings with no problem, through intense rain, uh, through the bike getting dropped, and they just keep ticking right along. I'm really happy with them. Um, I would definitely recommend them. Uh, then the next item working our way back are these Denali D2 lights, these auxiliary lights. And I've had these for a really long time. I had them on an older bike. And when I sold that bike, I swapped them uh, from there, that bike onto this one. Um, had them for a long time. They're very, very bright for their size. They're not the brightest lights around, but they're also quite small. And they're, they're quite bright. And for me, I use them usually during the daytime when I'm on the road, not so much off-road. And uh, they're a conspicuity tool. So to help drivers see me when I'm coming up behind them, or if they're about to make a left turn, maybe they'll be a little less likely to make a left turn right in front of me. Um, because again, they do catch your eye, they're, they're quite bright. And um, one thing I have done is they have alternate sort of um, screens that you can put uh, over the lens. And so you could have a throw beam that goes far, or you could have a flood beam that goes wide. And what I've done is on the left side for oncoming traffic, I have the wide beam, so it doesn't, it's not as blinding. Uh, and then on the right side, I have the throw beam. And that way I get to see uh, good coverage around the bike and um, as well as far in the distance. Um, sometimes when I have been out off-road in the dark before, they also come in handy there because you can really see the terrain around you and it's easier to navigate. But again, for me, primarily, this is a conspicuity and a safety um, modification rather than anything else. Let's see, now continuing to work our way back is this X screen uh, windscreen extender. It's from a company called MRA. I believe they're out of Germany. 
when I first got the bike, you know, I was really getting a lot of buffeting right here at the top of my forehead. And on long freeway days, you know, six, seven, eight hours doing a long haul somewhere, I'd get a really bad headache. I think my eyeballs were like vibrating from the buffeting. Uh, and so I was looking for ways to fix that. And this fits the bill. Uh, essentially, it's adjustable at two points, so you can set the angle and the height. And so when I have a long freeway day, um, I basically just um, adjust it up. Adjust it up like so, and it blocks a lot of the buffeting, sending it up and over my head. Uh, but when I'm you know, just riding twisties or riding off-road, then I put it right back down. It locks into place, doesn't vibrate, um, and it's great. And it's relatively hardy. Again, I mean, it's probably made some contact with um, hard surfaces when the bike's gone down, and it's survived okay. Um, no damage, no scratches. So, um, you know, again, I recommend it. It's, uh, it's useful, and if you have buffeting problems, then um, it might help you uh, address those. So continuing... Working back, I'm not going to show you this next thing because it's just too much of a pain in the butt to get to. Um, but I did get a lithium ion battery for the bike. And um, that was just a weight savings play, really. Uh, you know, I added a bunch of stuff to the bike and it felt like it was getting heavy. And swapping out the battery for a lithium ion saves about six pounds. So it's, you know, a considerable amount of weight for just one item. Um, I got uh, one with also a battery management system. And what that allows you to do, or what it does essentially, is before it fully discharges, it will shut itself off. So theoretically, you should never, um, you know, have a dead battery, right? If it dies, you take it out, you push a button, and you should have at least one or two more starts left in there. Um, and so that was, I thought, was kind of cool because, again, I'm always worried about getting stranded out in the middle of nowhere. But really, it was about the weight savings, which I know is silly. It's uh, 600, you know, once I have it loaded for camping, the bike's total payload is probably nearly 600 pounds. And, uh, you know, before I get on it and, you know, uh, six pounds is 1%, obviously. So, you know, I don't know how much of a difference it really makes, but it was, um, it was just something I wanted to do. So definitely not, not a must have. I think, um, as we work further back there, we get to the electronics and here, I think we're getting into probably not must have, but really nice to have territory. The thing about that battery compartment is, so this here is not the battery. Obviously this is a toolbox, uh, to take it off. You need to, uh, take out two Allen screws. So you've got to have your Allen wrench handy. This bracket comes out. You can take the box out that exposes the battery compartment. The battery is really wedged in there. Very hard to get to the terminals. So it's really hard if you want to attach electrical accessories. Really actually hard to do on this bike. It's hard to get uh, the terminals all connected up and get the battery back and happy in its little home. So you want to minimize how much you do that. And uh, for that reason, I got um, this uh, power center module from a company called Eastern Beaver. As far as I can tell, this is like one guy. It's a small business. All the parts are sourced out of Japan. It came shipped from Japan. Um, really high quality uh, workmanship, really high quality materials. And essentially what this thing is, is a fuse box. And it has, so you connect this one thing to your battery, and then you connect all your electricals to this thing. And it has eight circuits. Uh, you can fuse them with any basically um, fuse that you want. So for very you know high amperage or lower amperage, whatever your um, particular device that you're connecting requires. And six of those circuits are switched, meaning they will only run when the ignition's on. And then there's two that are not switched, and those are handy for, um, for example, running a battery tender um, to keep the battery topped up, um, or you know, I don't know what else you may want to run. Perhaps uh, your pump um, that you may want to run when the bike's not running. But uh, for the most part, I use the switched uh, channels, and it works great. It was, uh, it comes pre custom wired, like the, the wiring kits arrives with the product and they're pre-cut lengthwise to perfectly fit the Africa Twin because that's one of the bikes that I think he had when he first uh, came up with this item. And it makes installation, I won't say a total breeze, but it's it's not too bad at all. Um, it, it's maybe 20 minutes of work um, and then you start wiring all your stuff up to it. And so what I have connected to this is a number of things. So the, the Denali lights are connected to it. Um, I have... Uh, a GoPro charger that I carry in this pouch here. And um, that is wired onto a switched circuit as well. Then I have uh, these heated grips. Actually, we haven't talked about the heated grips. I'll come back to those, but my heated grips 
are, uh, are wired into this as well on a switched circuit. Uh, here I have a loose uh, pigtail that will, um, and I use this for a couple of things. I either use it for the battery tender um, when the bike's in the garage, or I use it for my heated jacket that I can then plug right into here. Um, and it's all very easy and accessible. And, and also I run my pump off of this as well. So um, I think those are my main electrical connections. And again, nice, uh, tidy organization, independently fused, plus master fuses um, that are redundant. And um, just a, a really nice little package. Definitely recommend this. I think there are a couple of other manufacturers, I believe, including Denali, uh, that make something like this. But I was really struck by the quality, and it's a small business. So, you know, um, good to support those. So let's come back, actually, then to the heated grips. This is one of the things on the bike I actually would not recommend. Uh, these are by a company called Coso. I think the model is called Apollo, the Coso Apollo heated grips. And uh, on previous bikes, I've had Oxford heated grips. And, you know, those are blazing hot. They are kind of goofy the way that they're set up. You have a central control module that you have to mount onto your bars and wire separately. Uh, and so what attracted me about the Coso Apollo grips uh, was that they have this integrated uh, control module right into the grip. So it just it looks a lot slicker, which... I will admit was a selling point. Uh, and the wiring is also much, much simpler, fewer wires. Uh, and really you just run the grips into a single uh, T connector and then that runs out to the fuse box and that's it. Um, so I was attracted to the simplicity of it uh, just from an installation perspective and, um, and just really the look of it. They make two different sizes. If you want to get them for your Africa Twin, despite my negative uh, recommendation here that's coming up, uh, get the shorter size. It'll fit perfectly. The longer size you're going to have to cut. Now, the reason I don't recommend these is they don't get very hot. They have five settings and really only the hottest settings really will help you in any sort of temperature where you're going to want heated grips. And even that setting, once you get into kind of the forties at freeway speed, they're not going to help. And the Oxfords are just so much hotter. It's kind of the other way around where they're almost too hot at the top two, three settings. And so you end up running them most of the time at the lowest settings, unless you're in sub zero temperatures. So uh, if you're going to get heated grips, and I do strongly recommend you get heated grips if you ride in the wintertime uh, or in cold temperatures, but I would get the Oxfords. And I think that brings us to the end of this review. Uh, if I think of anything else, I will edit it in later, but I think that's the whole bike. So I hope this has been useful and informative and um, see you next time.